Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today. We're very pleased to have one of our very own community members, Kent Broad, with us for a bit of Carbon 101. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where we're all Zooming from today across WA and Australia and pay our respects to the cultural elders of the past, present and emerging and acknowledge their spiritual connection to country. Today, I sit here in Wadjuk land where it is the season of Makaroo. This season saw the coming of the first rains and allowed free movement across the land to hunt for red meat animals, for food and clothing to help ward off the cold. Region WA believes in regenerating our regional landscapes and communities. We focus on supporting farmers who are investigating alternative production practices with the aim of minimising or reversing the impact of productivity constraints like climate change and soil acidity. I'd like to thank Kevin for offering up his time today for us to all be able to learn a little bit more about carbon. Kent has a wealth of knowledge of carbon through 35 years of experience from being a farmer and pastoralist in the Midwest to being on, board, on the board of Northern Agricultural Catchment Council and co-founding Outback Carbon. He has helped establish over 12,000 hectares of biodiverse revegetation projects in the Yarra Yarra Biodiversity Corridor in the Midwest of WA. This has driven his passion to revitalise rural Australia by providing environmental and social and economic solutions. He joins us today for our fifth Regen WA webinar. All of our past webinars have been recorded and can now be found on our Regen WA website for future reference. And in a fortnight's time on July 9th, we have Nick Kentish joining us again. So now I'll hand over to Kent to get us started and ask questions as we go through the session. Thanks. Thanks very much, Shay. It's terrific. I'll just share my screen and see how we go. Make sure everyone can see it. Thumbs up. Great, Kent. Terrific. Thank you very much. I also uh, uh, would like to acknowledge the First Nations people as the traditional owners and also the original regenerative farmers. Um, for those of us lucky enough or fortunate enough to read uh, Bruce Pascoe's Dark Emu and also Bill Gamage's uh, Greatest Estate on Earth, we'll have learnt a lot about uh, what we didn't learn at school and at universities and that um, just what uh, the First Peoples did on the land uh, with uh, their cool burning methods, their um, uh, tilling the soil for yam production, uh, silo grain, you know, silos for grain, and uh, sophisticated fish traps amongst many things they did. So um, I just thought I'd mention that. And also to thanks Shay for the opportunity to compliment, hopefully, what we've heard already from that standing uh, webinar series that uh, uh, Regen WA put together. I uh, just commenting to Shay that uh, we've had three Nicks in a row, Nicole Masters, Nick Kentish and Nick Kelly, and uh, probably the only sort of correlation with that was uh, was Kent with Kenty. So uh, anyway, we'll see how we go. For those that uh, who don't know me, my background, um, as mentioned, born in born and bred in the Midwest of WA, a little town called Three Springs, and uh, been in the carbon industry now for over 13 years. And um, but really, without knowing it, uh, first got introduced to carbon back in the late 70s, early 80s when I left school, went home on the farm. Mum and dad were already planting trees. Um, we had some pretty severe salt uh, problems starting to emerge after clearing the land in the 50s. By the late 60s, early 70s, uh, some of the valley floor was disappearing. So earlier on, there was um, an introduction to, to tree planting. And then in the early 90s, we um, decided to go cold turkey and went biodynamic farming um, with our sheep, cattle and cropping. And uh, within six years, noticed a, a real change in the in the colour of the topsoil and, and, the, and the, the depth we were starting to get it. Um, at the time, I remember trying to uh, get some interest from the universities, uh, some sort of science uh, support with what we were trying to do and just sort of get some data. But at that stage, there was not a lot of effort put into what was happening below the surface of the soil. Um, uh, mostly it was concentrated above the soil. So um, that was obviously the change in colour and the depth of that soil was uh, what was the carbon, um, the humus, the colloids starting to, um, to you know, penetrate deeper into the soil. 
Uh, with the first slide, I, I quite like this slide. Uh, it, it explains a lot about what we're trying to achieve. It looks predominantly more like a, a grazing enterprise, but really it's about getting carbon back into the landscape, both above ground in vegetation and grasses and also below the ground with the soil carbon. Um, the, uh, it's been well documented and there's some da good data on what, how much carbon we have depleted from the soils and from the landscape since, uh, since white settlement, European settlement. So, um, and, and this photo in particular shows that well, um, we get a we get a free ride if you like with the sun coming up every morning uh, obviously without that there'd be no no life but um, that's that's when everything happens with the the leaves opening up and the pho the photosynthesis process um, and it's carbon 101 I'm quite often you know you think people do complicate how everything works and really it's, it's as simple as the carbon dioxide getting sucked out of the atmosphere a carbon molecule getting stored in the biomass, the oxygen molecule being released, and we get paid for that carbon molecule that's um, that's in the biomass. And similarly with the soil, um, where the uh, the carbon sequestered there, we get paid for that carbon molecule. Now I've got to go to the next slide. A couple of years ago, I was lucky enough to be in Brisbane for Al Gore's. Um, uh, presentation at the Climate Reality uh, couple of day event. And I'd all often wondered about just how, when they talk about CO2 greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere, I always just thought it went on forever. But that thin blue uh, strip there that you see was really brought home to me just how how um, how it all works and, and, and what is it, what the atmosphere is. And it's that thin blue strip. And Al Gore described it as um, wherever you are at the moment, if you can uh, visualise driving for 10 minutes at the speed limit, uh, you will have driven from the surface of the earth through that uh, blue line. Um, so that sort of brought into reality really what, what it's all about. And the fact that at 350 parts per million, that blue atmosphere line there is already full and uh, we're heading towards 418 parts per million. So that's where um, obviously the opportunity for carbon farming comes in into play where we can get paid to to suck that carbon out of the atmosphere and permanently store it in vegetation and soils. It's interesting too watching the Australian Eastern Current series on ABC TV last night. The last series talked about the oceans being 500 times greater in volume than the atmosphere. So I just thought that was an interesting little um, side tidbit. As with any industry, um, there's uh, lots of industry uh, participants and uh, acronyms, information. That's, uh, so I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd work our way through these. The Carbon Farming Initiative, you may have heard of the CFI. Uh, it was um, actually one of the very few bipartisan uh, approaches to the, to, to the climate debate. Um, obviously, the climate, uh, climate wars, as it's talked about now, it's been going on for 10 years. But the Carbon Farming Initiative that the Rudd government set up, or the Gillard government, um, was retained by the Abbott government when it came to power. Um, he got rid of the carbon price, the $23 carbon price, but uh, the CFI was was kept in. And uh, luckily it has because it was able it enabled the industry to continue. Um, we were leading the world in the in 2007, 2008 with our, with our initiatives and with our leadership. Um, but when uh, the Abbott government came in, a lot of that was reduced uh, in terms of um, what we were doing, but the CFI was retained, which was a, was a real bonus because it allowed carbon farming to continue and carbon trading in Australia. The Emissions Reduction Fund was set up by the Abbott government as part of his the, the new initiative there, the ERF. $2.55 billion was set aside, um, taxpayer funds, a voluntary scheme uh, set up to reduce emissions and, and to basically pay through a, a reversed auction um, purchase scheme uh, of, of projects of, of their carbon credits. And that's now morphed into what they call a climate solutions funds. And another $2 billion has been set aside for that, uh, amongst other things. So the Clean Energy Regulator, um, it's the uh, independent statutory authority and, it, and it, it administers everything to do with the, the carbon farming initiative legislation. Um, and it's set up there to, uh, to help reduce emissions and uh, to increase the use of clean energy. Uh, project proponent, 
Um, basically, uh, whoever is deciding to think about a, a carbon farming project, um, there is the option of uh, doing it self. And in fact, the initial carbon farming initiative legislation was set up so farmers could participate on them by themselves. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't worked out that way. It's become quite a, uh, a non-trivial uh, process. Uh, it involves a, a lot of serious uh, work. And uh, so therefore, a carbon service provider is, is an option for for landowners, for land stewards to, um, to basically uh, get the project and uh, manage that project on their behalf. You may have heard of an ACU, it's an Australian Carbon Credit Unit. It's the, the common unit of measurement we use in Australia for, for a carbon offset or a carbon credit. Um, so the, the ACU term is used. We cannot uh, trade that ACU internationally. It's only within Australia that we can actually use the ACU. And it's one of the few things uh, that actually multiplies when uh, it's converted to, to for, for sale. So um, basically for every tonne of carbon, uh, the carbon molecules I was talking about that are measured in biomass and in soils, um, to create a common unit of measurement of greenhouse gases, it's multiplied by 3.67. So for every tonne of carbon sequestered, you actually get 3.67 ACUs. Um, I think methane is somewhere around 24, 25. So for every tonne of methane that you sequester or avoid, you get paid 24, 25 ACUs. Uh, with every carbon farming project, uh, land-based projects, 25 years is uh, basically the project life or the crediting period where ACUs are able to be generated by that particular project. And that's, that's the maximum at the moment for land-based projects. There is what we call a permanence period. So um, for you to get, uh, for you to be able to sell and trade those ACUs, um, you are guaranteeing, or the, the project proponent is guaranteeing that those, that tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent is being stored permanently for either 25 years or 100 years. At 25 years, there is looked at a, quite a conservative um, period of time. So basically 20% of the uh, ACUs generated from that particular project over the 25 years is, is taken away um, and put in a, uh, a set aside. So you only really ever um, uh, generate 80% of the ACUs in the 25 year permanence. But for 100 year permanence, you actually get the full 100%. In both auctions, there's uh, somewhere between six or 7% of project emissions. So there are emissions that you actually um, generate when establishing the project with fuel and travel and one thing or another. So the six to 7% comes off, but also if you choose the 25, you lose another 20% as well, which is, uh, which is good to remember. Uh, project registration. So it's very important to understand that you must register before you start. Um, uh, quite often the questions asked about, you know, I've got some trees that we planted 10 years ago. Can we start generating, you know, ACUs from those trees? And the answer is no, because um, uh, under the current uh, system, um, any new project, and it's because of the newness test, um, the project has to be new and above um, what's already happened. So it's very, very, uh, um, you, you just must get it all approved by this clean energy regulator before you start, before you turn a wheel. Uh, full CAM is the, uh, it's called the full, cam, full carbon accounting model. So it's a, a software tool uh, used by the, the federal government. And it's um, basically a, a measure of carbon sequestered over time. Uh, a lot of destructive sampling in the, over the last 20 years of all the different species of trees uh, have, have, have measured how much carbon the trees are sequestering over time. And uh, similarly with, with the carbon uh, below the soil in some instances. So getting on now towards, uh, I guess, um, carbon farming methods available. Um, there's what we call emissions avoidance. So that's uh, that's basically you get paid for carbon that you're going to emit. But if you take in a different uh, change in management technique or different technology, you get paid for the, uh, the emissions that you avoid into the future. And you've got a few of the main ones listed there. But the ones that we're really going to be concentrating on today, uh, vegetation and biomass, which I've talked about in the soils, and there's also a human-induced revegetation, uh, HIR, as it's referred to, which is more about um, uh, changing management 
in predominantly the rangelands and a grazing system whereby um, the vegetation has been suppressed for at least 10 years and by a change in management you actually get to um, uh, make, make that vegetation grow and therefore sequester carbon. So we've uh, made our mind up whether to, to go ahead with, with we'll find out anyway some more information. So first steps the way I the first steps the way I see it is really about you know what is your long term strategy on your particular uh, property. Um, there's been a few questions come through about um, bang for your buck and you know what's what's the one that gets uh, the quickest financial return. Well, I would take a step back from that and just say okay. This is a significant change. Um, you know, if you choose the 25 year permanence option, that's 25 years, it's a long time, but the 100 year permanence is, is obviously a, a lifetime. It's, a, it's quite a few generations. So you really need to be firm with your, with your strategy, with your particular properties about what you're going to do um, under, under each or whichever methodology you chain, choose and the, and the permanence. So a farm management plan, and that would involve your consultants and probably your financiers to, for them to understand uh, what you'd like to do. I, I see that as a, a really critical first step um, because it's, uh, you know, it's a significant change in, 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 of, of the system. And as I've mentioned, uh, the CFI has been set up so you could go it alone. Um, you can actually do it yourself as a, as a land steward, as a landowner, and there's a, there's a the link there, hot link to uh, to we um, planning a project. Uh, if what is usually the case, it's uh, just a bit overwhelming and too much. You uh, you can use a service provider, a carbon service provider, like someone like ourselves, who undertake that project, get the legal right to um, perform that project on your behalf and manage that project for the twenty five years. And it's a really critical point if you choose that option. Is that you have to be really uh, sure that you not only like the people that you're going to deal with for 25 years, but obviously um, uh, that they're going to be around for that time and, and be able to perform everything that they say they're going to do. And, uh, and, and it's a significant contract that, that you'll sign with a carbon service provider, amongst a lot of other things. Obviously, as part of that, they will explain uh, what, what costs are involved, if, if there are any at all, and potentially what income. Uh, is going to be generated by the project and that's really you know like putting your finger in the sky um, with that it's more about accus that are generated um, rather than particular you know who knows what the carbon price is going to be in the future or if uh, the federal government is actually going to put some sort of policy around the industry which which will drive demand for for more accus. Kent can yep. I just ask a question so um you can obviously do it alone, and that was one of the questions that came through prior, which is really good, but it is a sort of wrought with, I suppose, lots of details, which is often why people might search to turn to a service provider. Is there like a commission rate that the service provider takes? Is there like a general rule so people don't know that they can know that they're not maybe getting ripped off? Yeah, certainly. It's, it's a commercial transaction. So... Um, um, it depends on, on each carbon service provider, what they charge, whether it's commission, whether it's a share of the accus. Um, so it's really a case by case um, situation. Um, and everybody's got their own way of uh, presenting that to, to the land steward, to the landowner. And each of the different methodologies also um, have different costs associated with setting that project up. So. It's a, it's a difficult question to answer because it, as I say, it varies because of the different methodologies, but also um, the different service providers have, um, have their own way of, I guess, uh, working with that. And the last sort of part of the first steps, I suppose, you know, obviously is risks. As I mentioned, it's, it's 25 years uh, crediting period. So the actual project itself is going for at least 25 years. And, uh, and the permanence period of, of 25 years or 100 years. So um, you've got to really make sure that you read the fine print, uh, that your uh, consultants are, are around it, um, even succession planning, you know, talking about it with, with your kids um, or with your parents, whatever the case may, who the decision makers are, just really understanding just what is involved. Um, it, it's really important. 
just selecting the reforestation by environmental or mallee plantings, um, basically tree planting. Um, that's a that's one of the uh, most common one biodiversity plantings in particular these days. And there's two configurations that you can use. This one uh, showing the, the, the belt planting. Um, obviously, uh, thanks to Deep Bird for the photo, that it, it just depends on how you want to configure that. Um, there's obviously lots of uh, benefits with this, but there's also lots of, um, uh, well, there's a few negatives about it. And it's just up to a, a case by case situation about how you know you look at your landscape, how you look at your properties, and obviously, I mean, the most obvious one is, uh, especially with this year again, we've had some pretty significant wind events, and uh, having some sort of um, uh, layout across the landscape on your properties and, and your neighbours would uh, would hopefully slow that down and, and decrease the damage. Um, another big plus for it is that uh, there's actually it's that's at least 30, or between 20 and 30% more carbon yield per hectare of tree belts. And that's because there's no competition either side of the belt. Whereas uh, the block planting, which is the other configuration that you can use under this methodology, um, is that, as I say, it's 20 to 30% less carbon yield because there's competition between the rows. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, obviously the Mallee, the oil Mallee plantings in the past, there was a, there's a lot of this happening. One of the big negatives is that uh, with farm machinery and with, with cropping uh, programs, um, it, it's sort of, yeah, it's almost a too hard thing. But I don't know, I just see, you know, and, and Terry McCosker himself um, from Carbon Lake, he often talks about, uh, you know, the, the sweet spot in the landscape, in a farming system, whether it's 20 or 30% tree canopy across the property, and he does quote some papers that I think from South Africa a fair, quite a few decades ago, um, describing how <clears throat> it seemed like 20 to 30% uh, was, was that sweet spot where you maximise profitability, biodiversity values, natural capital, all those things. So, um, uh, and obviously wildlife corridors, you can join it up with some of your remnant vegetation and with the road verges and, and neighbours. The other configuration, thanks to Carbon Neutral, who I used to work with uh, for, for 10 years, um, is the block planting. And this is up in uh, the sort of Canna area where, you know, it's a pretty obvious um, situation there where it's been over cleared. Most of the, the shires in, in this area, but 90, 95% cleared. So um, significantly uh, when, and this photo on the bottom there is after three years. Um, so we were obviously pretty strong soil, but, you know, you really do get some results uh, with that. But as I mentioned, with the block planting, um, you do uh, lose that, that carbon yield through what, what full cam tells you. You can still graze um, uh, in, the, in the block planting. We, we generally um, advise at least two summers without any sort of stocking. And then it's a rotational grazing only. And similarly with the belt planting, you could still have that across your paddocks, but really it, it, it involves two at least two summers with, with no stocking and then uh, rotational grazing, you know, from then on. And obviously uh, the most obvious time to stop would be lambing time. You would think that the protection that that would, would offer. Uh, so, and there's pretty much lots of areas on, on every farm that you look at that would, uh, especially nowadays with the bigger type machinery and the, and the GPS farming, there are areas that are just, um, uh, not feasible really to to put the big machines in, so that most obvious areas that we could we could use for block planting. Then the other uh, methodology, probably more uh, relevant to to regen farmers in particular, is the is the measurement of soil carbon sequestration and agricultural systems uh, methodology, and uh, it's one that we've partnering with with Terry McCosker from Carbon Link and um, here in the West. If we can. Um, get some uh, things happening, it's great. Obviously, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about benefits of soil carbon. That's uh, been well and truly done with the previous webinars. Uh, but basically, um, the carbon is measured as, uh, as I'm about to explain. So there's, there's sort of three major steps that, that Carbon Link uh, offer. And uh, the discovery process is, is the first bit. And that's really a, a feasibility study. It costs approximately $2,000. And it's where uh, CarbonLink come in and basically ask all those questions um, and, and, and 
work out and give a bit of an indication about the economic economics of it. Is it going to be a goer or is it um, just uh, not feasible yet with the current um, technology and, and costs? So that's, that's basically the, the step one. Step two is then we decide, okay, the, the decision's been made to go ahead. It uh, looks feasible and, and it's, Terry's very conservative with, with what's presented, uh, make sure of that. Um, and uh, there is, it's quite restrictive under the current methodology where, which I'll explain in a little while, but they, so you've made the decision. Yep, let's, uh, let's uh, complement our farm income by getting some uh, income from carbon. And so the project's registered. And this is really important to get this registered before you change in management. And uh, it's not really, uh, I guess, um, there's, there's ways, like if, if you're already practicing region farming and, you, and you're thinking that you've already got some, something happening with your, your carbon, there are ways to adjust small, small adjustments in, in managing that, that situation so you qualify for, for it because it because of the newness um, provision and the additionality uh, rule. So basically those things are a part of step two where it, it's all as you see there on the, the bullet points. Um, and bullet point four, as I've mentioned before, you basically cannot commence before um, the start activity date, which is one that when the, the, uh, the project has been approved by the clean energy regulator. Uh, just pretty straightforward steps there um, as far as uh, accurate soil carbon measurement. Um, Terry's been working with uh, CSIRO for a number of years now to develop uh, a more cost effective way and efficient way of, of measuring the soil. And uh, stratification is the first part of that process where uh, the whole farm or the project area that you want to have in the project is um, stratified. Um, the soil core sampling points are uh, identified and then uh, the soil analysis, the, the sampling's done and uh, you can see those steps that follow. Um, so that's basically it there. Um, although I'm thinking I've lost a couple of slides for some reason. Shay, because that's come quickly. That it wouldn't skip anything, would it? It shouldn't have skipped any of the slides. Pardon? It shouldn't have skipped any of the slides. No, because that's that one. Because there's a bit to go with that. Why don't you have a look at um, some questions just while I have a look for the other slide? Yeah, no worries. So. I suppose what I think is really interesting with this whole carbon thing is people are interested in going out and doing something right now and they might have, or they may have already been increasing their soil carbon or going out and planting shelter belts and trees and revegetating some of their landscapes. But really they can't go and actually, they need to go and register the project and get it all approved before they even go out and buy the trees to start the revegetation, don't they? That's right. Yeah, it's very important to, to do a lot of research and uh, gather a lot of information just to, to see what is involved. Um, it, it does take time and generally, especially for tree planting, as you're aware, you really need to have the orders into the nurse, nurseries by October, November. So if you're, you're thinking of 2021 establishment, you really need to be onto it right now. Otherwise, um, it, it just gets all too late and it's, it's another year gone. So it really... Uh, especially with tree planting anyway, it revolves around uh, getting in early. With the soil carbon, it's not quite as uh, as uh, time uh, constrained because you can pretty much measure at any time of the year. So it's just a matter of um, of doing your research, like I said, and uh, and getting that discovery process um, done. And, uh, and that's the decision point right there. Yeah. Um, so... One of the questions that's come through just now is what has been your experience on getting eligible interest holder consent from banks? Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, I would say 10 years ago, it was very difficult. Um, we, uh, you know, even though carbon was, as I said, Australia was leading the world on a lot of fronts with, with carbon sequestration and methodologies and one thing or another, uh, the banks were very wary about that period, that permanence period. Um, West Australia has got the best carbon legislation in Australia, so the Carbon Right Carbon Covenant that uh, goes onto the title to the land, and that 
that ensures it's like a caveat, I suppose, that um, that ensures that that permanent permanence period is um, is satisfied, either 25 years or 100 years. And the bank saw that as a bit of an imposition, a bit of an extra uh, caveat, if you like. But since then, uh, especially with NAB leading the way with their natural capital and actually identifying the benefits of, of getting carbon into the landscape, they've actually turned that right around and they see it as adding value to the property itself, uh, whether it's trees or soil carbon, um, that they see that as now. Uh, yeah, but they're a bit more um, open to, to that. But I, the consultants are the ones for me, especially these days, the, you know, the reliance on, on off um, independent consultants. I think they have got a lot of um, say in it as well. Yeah, um, so I suppose like every, there's a lot of discussion around monitoring your soil carbon levels and how that initial year you might need to go out and do lots of testing and that initial cost, um, is that cost sort of coming down? Is there a more economical way of testing your soil carbon? Yeah, that's a good question. And I've found what I've done. That question slide is actually in the wrong position. So um, I'll go back to sharing, if that's okay. Yep, go ahead. And it'll, it'll answer that question in, in the slide, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned with... Um, with Terry and the CSRO, they've bought, it's been a big barrier up to now, the, the, the baseline measurement. Um, and uh, so um, he has, uh, with them, developed, um, and I'm just really frustrated here because it shows exactly what that talks about. Um, just scroll down, sorry about this. There we go, okay. so. That, that was that stratification that I was mentioning. Uh, you can see all the red dots on that screen. Can you see how that okay, Shay? Yeah, yeah, that looks good. Terrific. So that's identified in the in before you register the project, and then 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 the soil sampling. So this is where, um, in the past, it's been very uh, expensive and time consuming, and obviously getting the, the soil cores from the paddock to the to the laboratory to test the, the soil um, samples. So with, with, as I said, with CSRO, Terry's come up with this technology, uh, the machine here, which can be made portable, and he's looking at putting them in uh, containers um, so they can actually be on farm and to, to do all the measurement on site. Um, and uh, every five centimetres, the soil, the core soil sample is, is measured and then uh, and it spits out what the soil organic carbon is. And so that's, that's the scans unit that he's developed uh, with them, and that's helped to bring the cost of measurement right down. It's still it's still a cost, and uh, you know it's something that on a case by case basis, generally economies of scale come into play, which we'll see on in the following slide where um, you uh, uh, that's just the process that goes through. So here you can see. The cost per hectare. So generally, there's five samples per strata. Uh, there's 500 hectares on that top line, 3,000, 8,000, um, and they're the costs basically, as you can see, for a 500 hectares. If you're doing three strata, um, it, it comes out at about $64 a hectare. Obviously, at the other end, with increased areas, uh, it comes down to $11, and it does. It's bang for your buck. It's about granularity. It's about um, if you can't have a statistical, statistical relevant um, uh, uh, result, then you don't get the accuracy that you'd like to get. So it's a, it's a trade-off between the more money you spend with the measurement, the more accuracy you're going to uh, generate. If you go for less measurement, you, you're probably not going to end up with as many accuracy. So um, there is a bit of a trade-off, but that's all spelt out in the in the um, in the process. And here's just a, a chart that Terry shows with his presentations where, you know, obviously with the 500 hectares, um, the sequestration rate per, per hectare, Terry's sort of without obviously being on the properties, but he's looking at say 500 mil rainfall with uh, good clay tent soil, good clay content soil, probably in the Donnybrook Bridgetown area, looking at about five ton per hectare per year. And that's with obviously, you know, lots of perennial grasses, 100% ground cover, you know, all the Ubiute stuff. And uh, so five tonne of hectare per year, if you times that by 3.67, you end up with, um, uh, you know, 
20 tonne, see it, 20 accus per hectare, per hectare per year. So the numbers, uh, that's over 25 years. And obviously the assumption is at $20 a tonne. Um, whereas at the moment, <clears throat> the, the market price is sort of around that 15 to $16. Um, obviously, the bigger the program, the, the more money that can be made from it. So, um, but it all does relate on management is, is the absolute key. Um, starting off with clay with 500 mil rainfall um, is obviously a great start, but there's there's potential still for the for the more arid areas, for the eastern wheat belt areas. But albeit the, the carbon yield may not be as as good as the other areas. Okay. So there was also another question that came through, Kent. So are farm consultants aware of these schemes and open to promoting it with their farm clients? So I suppose these might be people who aren't necessarily carbon consultants, but more like your agronomists and things like that. What was the first part to it, sorry? Are farm consultants aware that these schemes are open to promoting it with their farm clients? Are they aware of it? Mm. That's a very good question. Um, I know one particular consultant that's very aware of it and he's pushing it. I'm also part of a group which uh, everyone might be aware of, uh, Ag Carbon, sorry, Ag Zero uh, 2030. And um, there's some consultants involved with that group as well who are really um, very proactive. The Grains Council of Australia have come out with their um, their policy on this. And so I think I think it's growing amongst rural areas and uh, it's, it's sort of, I think rural people are aware that the climate's changing. I'm not going to debate whether it's human induced or whatever, but we just know that our, that our winters are, are getting drier, that the rainfall's sporadic. And um, so, you know, and if you, if you can get complementary income through carbon, so, you know, why not? But it's a good question to ask your consultants, that's for sure, and your financiers, there's no doubt about that. Yes, I suppose that's one of the things about carbon. Like there's at the moment, there's a potential that you can earn money from it through these carbon credits. But really having carbon in your soil and building that carbon obviously has so many more benefits. And then that can obviously have those multiplier effects on your business and your income through just say your, if you're having cattle run across it and things like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a, um, it's a win-win all around really. Um, it's not a get rich quick scheme. I think uh, sometimes there's a bit of, um, especially when the price goes up and, and everything, but really it's, it's oh, the way I see it, and obviously very biased, but um, uh, it's a complementary thing. It, the, the good land stewards are going to get financial return from, from carbon. There's no doubt about that. Um, albeit, as I said, there are risks involved. Um, if you're not increasing your soil carbon over time, you know, there's, there's consequences for that. So um, you're going to be pretty confident that uh, with your, with your with regen farming or just a change in, in grazing techniques, um, if um, as long as you're confident that that's going to happen, I, I see it as just another, basically you're getting paid for something you're going to be doing anyway. So um, yeah, it all helps. A little bit extra in the bank account at the end of each year wouldn't be a bad thing. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, as I said before, there's lots of different models for what carbon service providers um, uh, show uh, individual land stewards. But uh, if it was me anyway, and you don't particularly need the cash up front, um, you know, basically taking a share of the accus and, 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 you know, hedging on those increasing in the future would be a, would be a a great way to go, I would think, but each to their own. Uh, some people obviously would, would need it, especially in the dry years. A bit of cash doesn't uh, doesn't go astray. Um, yeah, one of the other questions that came through was, are there actually many projects in WA that are already a part of these schemes and already getting paid for some of their carbon? Yeah, most definitely, especially in the revegetation uh, side of things. Um, that's been happening for, for a long, long time. Uh, in the voluntary market, especially um, soil carbon, no. There's uh, there's only actually been two soil carbon projects, to my knowledge, in Australia that have actually generated accus um, through the Clean Energy Regulator, so uh, well through the ERF. So, um, but with with tree vegetation projects, yes, definitely. Early in the early years, it was more of a royalty per per hectare per year. Um, so the the landowner for the use of that land. Um, 
would get paid a, an annual royalty, if you like. Um, I tend to favour a, a, a maybe a combination of both, or as I said, um, actually be participating in, in generating accus and having a share of the accus to yourself. But yes, there'd be uh, there'd be a lot of um, farmers that uh, around already starting to um, participate and get accus. Yeah, well, that's good to hear that people are actually getting on board with it. A few questions coming through in the chat box. So are there requirements in the scheme around grazing between the trees and the fire? Sorry, what was that first bit? Are there requirements in the scheme around grazing between the trees and fire, like addressing risk? Yeah, good questions. Fire is always one that comes up uh, and... Generally, we see grazing as a fantastic uh, fire mitigation tool, and uh, the, the, the administrators accept that, and, and that's where you know grazing is allowed uh, between the trees. Um, you certainly don't want a situation where, when the feed pinch comes in in April May, that you set stock and, and really hammer the trees. Um, but that all becomes, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a management thing. But uh, definitely, I see grazing as complementary and enhancing the whole the whole system. Um, that whole uh, recycling effect that we get, and the bonus of that is that the fuel load is is kept down in between the trees. Um, and so, yeah, I, I see it working really well together. Well, that's good. albeit that sorry, the first two summers, as I as I said, really, you, you, it's very difficult to put any stock on the on the young plants for the first uh, two summers. Yeah, it's good that those sorts of considerations are being looked at and considered. Um, so is there also, like, is it benefit getting together as a group of farmers and putting up a project sort of together and help increase the returns and decrease the costs? Absolutely. Economies of scale uh, really come into play. And, uh, you know, I had a bit of experience with Carbon Neutral about marketing the accus, and and I love it because really it's about, a lot of things. It's about connecting city to country. It's about telling your story, um, what you're doing on your farm. The better the story, obviously, um, the more money you can basically ask for your ACUs. Um, at the moment, through the ERF, an ACU is just an ACU. You know, it's um, you, the ACU generated from the from the best regen farm with you know producing all the beautiful, healthy food is regarded through the ERF, same value as one generated from a uh, wind farm or, a, or a avoided something. So on the voluntary market though, um, if you've got a good story to tell, um, the some of the emitters, they really like to, to jump on that with their ESG, their, their social license as it were, and um, put it on their website. And, and I really like the fact that even, you know, mums and dads can, uh, can purchase these accus from from properties that they hear about it doing you know doing good stuff good good things. I suppose that's sort of a bit of like impact investment um, into that space, like people in the city wanting to put their money into a good cause and having that environmental posit like effects being positive. Um, one of the other questions that came through. So you you were saying that the accus can't be traded outside of Australia. But is there ways that you can sequester carbon here in Australia but participate in a carbon scheme elsewhere in the world? Yeah, absolutely. When I was with gold uh, with carbon neutral, is um, we uh, were the first project in Australia to to get gold standard accreditation. Uh, gold standard was a was a carbon sa standard set up by WWF um, back in two thousand and one, and based in Switzerland. And uh, those credits you could trade internationally. In fact, we exported. Uh, a few parcels overseas, and I think they still are. Um, the only issue with it is that uh, there's a double counting type um, uh, problem that comes up, which I haven't got time enough to explain now, but basically uh, you you have to offset those gold standards with another carbon credit. So it's a, it's a convoluted way of explaining it, but basically that's the only way that you can sell into the international uh, market at the moment. Because is that market a lot, like you said, it was like $15 a tonne or something here. Is that overseas, like European market, a lot higher price? Yes, it's a really interesting question. Uh, there's places, I think it's either Denmark or Sweden, where the price is about $100 Australian per, per ACU. Um, 
the the European price, the last time I looked, which was actually a while ago, it was about a month ago, but that was about thirty dollars, thirty six dollars Australian. So at the moment, there's uh, there's a real variance around around the world. Um, some are as low as five or six dollars. Um, so once again, at uh, in that situation on the open market, um, the 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 projects that are seen as you know high biodiversity value, high um, ethical social license values now all that part of the story which I was explaining um, they, they certainly get paid a lot more so uh, that's a that's more of a marketing side um, but yeah so would you see the price here like it's not going to go down it's only going to go up yeah well uh, depends who you ask and as I say put your finger to it but really the federal government at the moment, both sides, actually Albanese even came out last night, I think on 7.30 and said that uh, they won't be supporting a carbon price and think that, it, you know, it can be done through the, the tech, technical side of things and renewable energy. And, you know, we've, we've already got too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, so we need to reduce it. And the only way to reduce it is is through land-based projects and, uh, and also obviously blue carbon and, and mangroves. But... Um, it just depends. It's the demand and supply situation. At the moment, uh, the federal government is relying on organisations to voluntarily say, yep, we'll, uh, we'll offset our emissions and, and pay um, farmers to, to sequester the carbon. But um, really, if they were to come out, in fact, there was a report done by an industry uh, consultancy group, Repitex, yesterday. If Australia was fair dinkum about their Paris Agreement and also um, to, to keep it 1.5 degrees by 2040, uh, the price of carbon needs will, will need to get to $100 an acute by then. Um, so it's really a demand and supply issue. Um, the, the, as I say, it's become a, a political football in Australia. There's no, you know, basically all the big emitters are just waiting to, uh, to get some consistency and some sort of long-term strategy about how we're going to um, keep keep it down to 1.5 and, and definitely two. Um, once that comes into play, then then everybody can can work towards that. And, uh, you know, I just don't think we'd be able to produce enough accus in Australia just for Australia's emissions, let alone some overseas countries. Yeah, wow. Like, it's, it's not good that it's becoming a political football, but I just hope that it's able to um, make some progress, I suppose, and, like, those big emitters are looking for that consistency and hopefully we can somehow arrange and get that happening for them so people yeah but even with that you know the as I say the, the voluntary price there's some people getting $25 for their accus in Australia at the moment so you know that's obviously a, a niche market and it wouldn't be a high volumes but um, uh, that's just in the voluntary market but it, it is achievable through through some hard work and some really good projects but uh, yeah, the logical thing is for the government just to set the policy and then get out of the way and let the market determine um, what the price is going to be in the supply, demand and supply. Yeah, so I suppose one of the take homes is like there's two different ways of sequestering carbon and either whether that's through the revegetation or whether that's through improving the soil or organic carbon, um, like in your farming practices. So, yeah, I think that's really, really cool. Um, was there any other way, a few minutes away from 1.30, was there any final words that you sort of wanted to say? There hasn't been any other questions. So if anyone out does have any questions, make sure you put them in the chat box. Otherwise, Kent, was there anything that you wanted us to remember before we all logged out today and went out in the paddock? Yeah, sure. No, I just, um, I just think that uh, it, it's a good opportunity for us to, to get carbon back into the landscape um, and get paid for it. And of course, uh, all the benefits that have been mentioned in the previous webinars, especially with soil, um, but with the trees in particular, I think it, there's, a, there's almost a case for the state government to, um, to bring in a policy to, um, to revegetate, say, you know, 20% of the landscape. Um, in the 60s, the state government uh, had a policy of clearing a million acres a year. So it, it has been done before, but in the, in the reverse um, order, obviously. Uh, there's been some really good papers. Dr. Mark Andrich, uh, when the Centre for Water Research uh, was going in the UWA back in 2013, put out a great paper about um, the overclearing that's occurred in the Southwest Land Division and, and proving that it uh, uh, wasn't all climate change. It 
was 50% climate change, 50% overclearing. And conversely, that um, by putting trees back into the landscape, it would uh, generate more rainfall. And he's he's pretty confident even a small 50 hectare block will um, will increase the, the rainfall in that particular area. It'll be a measurable difference anyway. So it just makes sense to um, to increase increase the vegetation again. Obviously, it's a trade-off. You don't want to be um, uh, sacrificing all your most productive land, but I think we need to, as a community, uh, look at those areas where perhaps are not as productive as others and we can still grow plenty of biomass. Um, but soil carbon is really the big kicker. You know, it's um, the oceans are the biggest carbon sink. No, I, th I think actually soil carbon might be bigger than the oceans. Um, anyway, someone will probably know out there, but... It's certainly a significant potential carbon sink and we, we haven't even got going yet. So um, to me, soil carbon is the absolute, you know, it's a no-brainer. We've got to get into it. The bee's knees. Um, someone asked yep. a question and there is no dumb question. So he said, is the Accu trading price a per-year price or a one-off price? What was that, sorry? Is the Accu trading price a per-year price or a once-off price? Yeah, when you uh, if you go in and uh, into the auction system, the lowest cost abatement auction, and personally I haven't participated in that, but there are contracts for five, seven, or ten years, and that is a fixed price. So you deliver accus every year for the for the term of that contract. Um, I've been more involved with swap price and just annual annual prices. So once the accus are generated, a bit like um, with your cropping or with your with your livestock. Once you've got them ready for sale, you look around what the best price is and uh, and, you, and you grab that price. But there are also um, voluntary offtake agreements um, that, we can, that we've entered into with, with some emitters where a price is um, uh, committed over time. If there is uh, an increase in the, the, the market price each year, both the, the farmer and the, the emitter um, get a slice of that. So it's not... It's not just um, you know all one way. Um, if the price continues to go up, both parties take take their piece of that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, hope that answers your question, Andrew. Um, yeah, I think I know that I've learned a lot about carbon in the last few weeks and months, and I think it's very all very quite technical. But I think you've done, given this a great way of trying to break some, down some of those barriers around our understanding. Um, sorry, there's one question that's just been put up. Um, what do you think about the West Australian government putting in place a land restoration fund like they have in Queensland and farmers selling accus to the LRF and the ERFT? Yeah, I saw that. Thanks, Craig. Uh, g'day, mate. Um, yeah. I think there's definitely a place for something like the Queen, Queensland Restoration Fund here in WA. Um, WA, unfortunately, in the past, uh, the previous government really set us back in terms of, um, you know, we're five years behind the eastern states. I think this this particular government now is, is showing signs that they, they want to do something about that. And there's been a lot of discussion about uh, such a, a thing happening here in the West. And uh, it would be a fantastic initiative because it not only... Um, gives more interest, but it also allows a lot of research funds to come in, matching funds from universities and to develop new methodologies. And uh, obviously baseline measurement for, for soil carbon measurement is, is, a, is a desperate need for that because that's a real barrier at the moment for large scale uh, measurement of soil carbon. Yeah, no, that's really good. Um, hopefully the government some people are listening and they might look at these things in the future. <laughs> um, so I would like to take this time to say thank you, Kent, for joining us today. I think everyone's learned a lot about a little bit more about carbon and hopefully we can see some more people going out there and looking to sequester more soil carbon as well as doing some more reveg projects. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to say thank you and everyone for joining us. Um, I look forward to it catching up again soon. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Kent.